Let me start this morning with a story I've told before, but it's been a while, so I think it might bear repeating. As we dig into our series, technically, uh, Jeremy started it last week for us, but we this is, this is the, the series that we are looking for called You Are Not Alone. I, I grew up Pentecostal. What a privilege that was. <laughs> Shout out. Okay. <laughs> Pentecostal Semis of Canada represent. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to get a woohoo for that. But I'm just telling. That's the truth. That's just the truth. That's the truth. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking I'm third generation POC, maybe three and a half generations, four maybe. I don't know. It's, 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 a, lo- it's a lot. It's in the roots. And what that means is that I have been taught about and have experienced the charismatic work of the Holy Spirit throughout my whole life. And this is why I say it's, it's a huge privilege. Pentecostals believe that um, everything you read about in the book of Acts is still available for us today. Oh, that's, that's all of the gifts of the Spirit, like 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 and Romans 12, they're all still in operation. And that, uh, that I'm a little just distracted because I'm so loud. I don't happen to be in these monitors, do I? If I start to, to shout, Brad, these people are in trouble. Like, it's trouble. It might just be that it's up here and I just, it's too loud for me. I just, I'm, I'm scaring myself. We believe that all the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, like that, like, like such, are still in operation. And that Jesus continues to baptize believers in his Holy Spirit, empowering them to continue his work. And that the con- confirmation of that is the sign of speaking in tongues. And this means that I have had the incredible opportunity to see some amazing things, miraculous healings, lives transformed, words of prophecy and knowledge and wisdom given to people that are shockingly accurate, and so much more. I I was brought up from a very young age to learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit and to distinguish it from my own desires. And so I counted a very high privilege to have been exposed to all of this Um, in a biblical and thoughtful way for so many years. I know that's not everyone's experience, and that was mine, and I continue to always be grateful. I will also say that growing up Pentecostal means I have also seen some crazy things. I have seen people barking like a dog. I have seen a lot of this, actually. This is a classic. Pushing people over and calling it slain in the spirit. Mm, Some of you have seen that. Some of you have had that. Being told, I was, it was like youth camp or youth convention, one or the other, Pastor Ethan, I'm not sure which, but I was a teenager, and I was told to turn to my neighbor, neighbor and prophesy on command. I was like, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Uh, the low point for me with some of the excesses and crazy things I'd seen was uh, certainly near the end of Bible college, when I, the choir I was traveling with was asked to all line up at the front. And the speaker, who maybe have been what it was like a traveling evangelist or prophet or something, I can't remember, uh, came w- to pray for each one of us. He's like, you guys, you guys in the choir, go line up at the front. And then he started to like pray for people. And I was like, I was maybe like here, and the lineup started there. And I started to notice that um, he was going to shout and pray until you fell down. I saw, I saw that's what the the situation was. I'm not proud of what I did next. (laughs) And I was not a child when I did it. I was a full grown grown up. He got to me and I waited a few seconds, looked very sincere and fell down so that he would move on with his praying for other people. See, if you didn't, if you, if you've never seen this kind of thing happen, this is not really the vibe of of most churches. You don't understand that sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. (laughs) I've never done it since, and I, I felt stupid when I did it that time. But I was just like, I'm, I'm so, I, I can't. I'm overanalyzing this. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And that was, I was in my 20s for sure when that happened. And I think that it was that. It might have been that incident or several incidents around that time. I remember, I think I came home for a break from school, and I, was, I had a conversation with my dad about all of this Pentecostal charismatic stuff, because it's my parents' fault that I'm in the middle of this anyway, right? Raising me this way. And I remember asking him if it was okay, and sincerely, is it okay if I just believe in Jesus and forget about all the rest of it, because it's too much? 
I believed in the Holy Spirit and his gifts. I didn't think the Bible was wrong about it. It just seemed that people could not seem to stop the pendulum from swinging to the extremes. We were chasing after the sensational versus we don't allow that here. And there was just like two extremes and I didn't seem to be able to see a place where we could just live in what I saw in the scriptures. Saying yes to what the Holy Spirit wanted to do and doing it in order and, and doing it correctly. I knew the balance was key, but it did not seem possible in my experience. And I don't remember what he told me, but I remember he sympathized with me. I suspect that he had seen some of the same things many times in his life. And I don't, and here's a little bracket, a little side, sidebar for you. I don't know if you know my dad, but if you do, you know that he was teaching the balance in these things for over 40 years he has been. It was just that I was still just catching up to it. I've always known about, a lot about Acts 1-8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And Acts 2-4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But what I think I was missing in order to understand um, the balance here was I was missing John 14 to 16. Although the Holy Spirit's activity is probably best demonstrated for us in the book of Acts, perhaps no book of the Bible contains more theology of the Holy Spirit. You want to learn a new word today to impress your friends? Uh, the theology of the Holy Spirit is called, does anybody know? Pneumatology. If you, listen, Bible college grads are not allowed to answer the question. Okay. <laughs> pneumatology. So the theology of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps no book of the Bible contains more pneumatology than John. And especially here, what we're going to hear Jesus himself say in, in chapters 14, 15, and 16. So if you can't figure it out by now, maybe you're new with us. When I'm saying things like that, this is a cue for you to already just be pulling that up in your Bibles, okay? Pull that up in your Bibles right now. John 14, we're going to start today. Maybe I could say it like this. Uh, I, I needed the gospel of John to be able to say yes to the book of Acts and beyond. So I want to go through these chapters together over the next couple of weeks and see what Jesus says about his spirit. And we're going to start in chapter 14. Um, you can be in the YouVersion Bible app. Go to more and then events and you'll see this already loaded there for you. And I've even broken it down into how we are going to be talking about it this morning. It'll be on the screen for you, but of course there's also Bibles in front of you if you would like that. So let's start with the first couple verses here in John 14. And if you're looking in a Bible like mine, you'll see lots and lots of red letters. These are the words of Jesus. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So the context here, and this is what, why we're reading this beginning piece, this context is, is here is that Jesus, if you can flip back in your Bibles or scroll back uh, one page, you'll see in chapter 13 two really difficult things have happened. Jesus predicts his betrayal by Judas, followed by Jesus predicting Peter's denial that he even knows him. And then the next thing that's recorded that he says is, do not let your hearts be troubled. He starts by telling them not to worry. See, they should have been comforting him, right? They should have been being like, oh, it's not, it's okay, Jesus, or whatever they would have said. He tells them instead of, of him being comforted, he comforts them and tells them, they don't know this yet, but we know this in hindsight, that they are just about a, just a few weeks away from something even better than his presence with them. And that's a very big promise. And it starts here with the assurance that he's got a plan for their eternity and that he's coming back for them. Of course, all of this is not super clear to the disciples. It doesn't all make sense. It's a little easier for us uh, in hindsight. And so let's read the next few from um, 5 to 14 says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Okay, 5 to 14. We could just, and we have, and we will probably, again, camp here for a very long time. But this morning, we are not going to stay here very long. Uh, These are some incredible verses. Just some incredible verses. Jesus is trying to explain to them how the Father and the Son are one, and what their relationship looks like, and how we can relate to both of them, and what that means. There is just so much in these verses. And so, but we don't really have time this morning to camp on those, but be free, please, on your own to meditate on those scriptures because they're so beautiful. And it's from that teaching, it's from what he has just said in those few verses that he tells them, but that's not all. So this is an incredible thing and how this works is incredible and and you can ask anything in my name, it's incredible, but that is not all, verses 15 to 21. If you love me, Keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Okay, it's, um, I read it as slowly as I could. I talk fast and I read fast and I do all the things fast. But uh, I read it as slow as I could because it's so important that we just hear what Jesus is saying. Don't take this for granted. This is amazing. If, if they were sad or confused about Jesus leaving them, and Jesus is at this time in his ministry, he's so close now to the cross and he's warning them that this, this is coming. They, they, he, he's saying, like, they can be more than okay with the fact that Jesus is, is going to not be with them anymore. They can get excited about it because he says he's sending another advocate. And, of course, the implication by saying another advocate is that Jesus is their advocate already. And he's sending another to help them and to be with them forever. And he calls him the spirit of truth. So this word advocate, um, in other translations you might see it as helper. In older translations, oh, like if you know, if you grew up in the King James, what did the older translations say? Does anybody know? Comforter. The comforter has come. Write that. Comforter. We don't use the word comforter anymore because in modern English it doesn't mean the same thing. But this Greek word is parakletos. And it's awesome. It's an awesome word because it's not really translatable. I love when words aren't perfectly translatable, when you need like a whole phrase to translate them properly. And, and we anglicize it sometimes, and we call, uh, we say the, the, instead of advocate, we will maybe call him the paraclete, the paraclete. So this advocate, this paraclete, is uh, translated maybe best as someone who is called in or called alongside. 
And not just that, though, because in the original language, it's, of course, just like in Greek, it's so often true. It, it's not just that that's what it means literally. It, it's, it's why that person is called in. It's why that person is called alongside that gives this word its true meaning. Uh, a, a parakletos might be a person who is called in to be a witness in court, standing up for someone, defending them. Or, or this advocate uh, uh, who is called in to plead someone's case. Maybe uh, uh, the parakletos can also be an expert called in to give advice in some very difficult situation. Or a person who is called in when a company of soldiers is discouraged. And this person comes in to give new courage, to encourage this group. Always a, a parakletos is someone who is called in to help in a time of trouble or need. So what Jesus is saying here is kind of like this. Following me is a hard task. And I am sending you out on a very difficult job. But I am going to send you someone, another parakletos, who will guide you into what to do, who will enable you and will empower you to do it. You are not alone. But there... Um, there are questions, of course, springing to the minds of the disciples, as, you, as, as it would be true for you if you were there. And Judas, not Judas Iscariot, I love how the Bible says this, like, just to be clear, the other Judas, because that poor guy, right? Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching." My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Did Jesus just dodge the question? Did anybody notice that? Did Jesus dodge the question? No, he did. Of course not. Uh, Jesus is just throwing back. He's throwing back for the other Judas. He's throwing back um, to verse 6. He's saying it's not possible for people to get to know the Spirit outside of knowing Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It's his Spirit that he's sending. So when you know and you love and you follow Jesus, then you will know his Spirit. It's not that he's keeping his spirit from anyone. It's just that you have to get to know the spirit by following Jesus. And how do you know then if you love Jesus? He says it's obvious in the way that you live. Here, the test of love is obedience. It doesn't hit our modern ears very easily, does it? It was by obedience that Jesus showed his love for God. He's going to say that specifically in a few more verses. And it is by our obedience that we show our love for Jesus. Real love is not easy. But it is shown by true submission to him and to his will. And this is not like an offhanded comment from Jesus. Not that he ever did that, but it's just not, it's not a throwaway statement. He repeats this theme of if you love him, you will obey his commands. You will do what he commanded. That's a way that you show love. He, he, he repeats it throughout the passage. And I just want to be clear, of course, that love shown by obedience doesn't earn us the Holy Spirit. This is not a, a works-based salvation or anything like that. This is more of like a proof is in the pudding uh, kind of situation. The one is demonstrated by the other. The fact that you love Jesus is demonstrated by what your life looks like. There's no getting around that. And this love that Jesus is talking about here is not emotionalism, of course. It's, it's, it's that self-sacrificing agape love that John loves to highlight. John, the, the author of this gospel. And when you read through his gospel, I mean, he, this, is the, the, <laughs> this is the disciple who called himself the disciple who Jesus loved. I love this guy. He also is, is the author of three letters in, later on in the New Testament. And this is the guy who wrote, Beloved, I'm going to say in the King James because I learned it as a salty song when I was like five years old. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. 
God is love. I don't think it's repeated in the scripture, but it is in the song. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Okay. Teach your, give your kids the scriptures in song. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. This is the same John. So John talks about love in such a serious way. He talks about it all the time. He understood it from Jesus himself so close to Jesus while he walked on the earth and then understood this love and talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. This agape love. For John, love is the basis of everything. Jesus, or God loves Jesus and Jesus loves God and God loves us and Jesus loves us and we love God through Jesus and we love each other through Jesus. All bound together by this real love. This is a lot of love. But it's real love. And here is the incredible promise. I told you, Brad, like the screaming might happen, so I'm glad, we, I'm glad we dealt with that earlier. The incredible promise here is that the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will come and make his home in you. When you love him, and you walk out that love in obedience to him. Ooh. He will make his home in you. I don't know if you feel lonely or sad or afraid or insecure or just fill in the blank. You, follower of Christ, are one who when you love Jesus and follow his commands, that, that the, the God of the universe comes and makes his home in you. That changes everything. But of course, there's more. <laughs> there's just always more. Verse 25 says, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In the Old Testament, false prophets often prophesied peace when there was no peace. <clears throat> like in Jeremiah 6, he points that out. In New Testament times, there was something called the Pax Romana, uh, the, the Roman peace, which was a, kind of an ironic thing to call it because how did the Romans keep peace? Through war and brutality. <laughs> Brutal force is what kept the peace of Rome. And then people would say, of course, shalom, when people said peace be with you, it was an expression of hope and goodwill for your life. I hope things are well with you. But when Jesus said he would give his peace to his disciples, so much more was involved with any of those things. He gave them a peace of mind, no matter what they faced. And he would do this, give this incredible peace, not like the world gives, not like the world defines it. He would do it through the gift of the advocate. We also get another glimpse here in that little passage we just read into what the Spirit will do. It says he will teach us all things and remind us of everything Jesus said to us. And when you start to think about this, the most beautiful picture of how this works starts to form. When we love Jesus, we, which is shown in our obedience to him, following him, we are given the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you are given the Holy Spirit not once you, um, I just want to be really clear in case you mishear this. It's not that you have to do a bunch of obedient things and then you get the Holy Spirit. Like if you level up to the Holy Spirit. Like this is not what I'm saying. You, you get the Holy Spirit from your first step of obedience, which is putting your faith in Jesus. And you receive the Holy Spirit from that moment on. Okay, just want to be really clear about that. So we are given the Holy Spirit and then God comes and makes his home in us. And as he lives in us, we are then taught and reminded by the Spirit so that we are empowered to grow in our love and our ability to follow his commands. 
which then allows us to more deeply understand that he has made his home in us, which allows us to more intimately hear and understand um, uh, our, our, how, how much we are loved by God and grow in our love for God and grow again in our ability to hear and follow his commands. Do you see how this works? The Holy Spirit is called alongside. He's called in to lead us deeper and deeper into the truth of God. He will show us how to test everything against the teaching of Jesus. That's what he does. Our advocate is not restricted to the giving of spiritual gifts. Sometimes we think about that. That's the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the gifts, though he does. But we don't learn about that in, our, in the scripture until a little bit later. The advocate isn't restricted only to helping us develop Christ-like character, like the fruit of the Spirit. Again, that's true, but we're going to learn about that a little bit later. Jesus doesn't mention either of those things. The first and most important thing to know is that the Holy Spirit will create a sense of intimacy with Jesus and by nature of who he is, the Father. It's just reminding me of, of um, Romans 8, when the Spirit cries out in us, Abba, Father. This relationship where we, we get to know who God is more and more deeply, more and more intimately because of the work of the Spirit in us. So when I meditate on these verses, I am so glad, I am so glad that in my young adult, that my young adult self didn't get so discouraged by spiritual imbalances I saw around me that I set the Holy Spirit aside in order to protect my heart or protect my faith or whatever I thought I was doing. I would have missed the point. I can't do this Christian life on my own. I need a paraclete who is called in to lead me to the heart of God through Christ. I need someone to strengthen and encourage me to be able to follow Jesus in any circumstance, empowered to obey his commands, not as a burden, but as a joy. I'm, I need someone to help me to do that. And knowing him through his spirit means that then if I, can, if I can do that, then I am learning to trust him more and more. The closer I get to his heart, the more I know he has only agape love for me. And then I know I don't have to be afraid. Whatever the spirit is doing in my life, whatever gifts he wants to give me, however he wants to work, whatever he wants to do, I can say yes to whatever and, and whatever he wants to do in and through me. And I can have peace whatever happens around me or to me because of the work of the spirit in my life. He's so good. He's so good. Then Jesus says a couple more things. In this particular chapter, Jesus says a lot of things, but a few more in this chapter. You heard me say, I'm going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Don't get, uh, don't get sidetracked with Jesus saying the Father is greater than I. Uh, that's a, another theological thing that we could, we could uh, unpack, but it doesn't mean that the Father is better than or higher than or more powerful than. It means that Jesus is submitted to the Father in this work that he is doing. And also Jesus says, come now, let us leave. But then you'll see he doesn't leave at all. So, I, well, we can talk about that maybe next week. Jesus uh, here, again, shows his love for the Father by his obedience. He's modeling what he's asking from us. And while it, it was brutal and it was heart-wrenching, Jesus' obedience changed the world forever. And now he's telling his disciples that they need to be less about their own grief, less about their own worry, less about their own troubles, because they were getting sad and worried about him going away. And they need to be more about the things that bring their master joy. It says that it's Jesus, if Jesus says it's better that he goes away, believe him. He's the one that for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, Hebrews 12 tells us. 
the NIV application commentary kind of sums this up for us. I thought this was helpful this way. The experience of the spirit promised by Jesus also points to benefits that are truly astounding. Believers will sustain the miraculous works of Jesus. They will have intimacy with God in prayer. They will recall God's word with conviction, all with the aid of the Spirit. A brief perusal of the book of Acts will show you that this is exactly the profile of the earliest Christians. And it is safe to assume that this must have been the experience of the believers in John's church. Christians were reproducing not merely the work of Jesus, they were continuing the presence of Jesus in the world. Perhaps we could put it this way. As the Son incarnated the Father's presence in the world, so now the Spirit brings the Son's presence into the world through the life of the believer. That's John 14. And so, what do we take away with us from this powerful passage? I thought about a lot of things as I was writing this. I thought about some good old-fashioned homiletics class alliteration. I thought about putting up three words on the screen that said, I want you to take stock of the presence, the practice, and the power of the Spirit in your life. That sounds pretty good, right? Take stock of your your understanding of, your ability to uh, take notice of the presence of the Spirit how you practice that, what does that look like, and, and are, are you showing your love for Jesus through obedience to his commands and, and the power of the Spirit? Are you empowered to do those things for him or are you trying to do it on your own strength? There's lots there. I thought perhaps about asking you three questions. I like to do that too. Questions are actually more my vibe than three points of alliteration, but uh, three questions from this passage. Do you know Jesus? Do you obey Jesus? Do you receive and cooperate with the work of his spirit in your life? I think this passage begs all three questions. And if those are helpful to you, just write those down and that's your application for this morning, okay? <laughs> just take that, just take that, ask those questions or think, taking stock of the practice, presence and power of the spirit in your life. As I prayed, I was drawn back to the fundamental point. I kept saying, Holy Spirit, there's so much just in this one chapter. What would you want to say to your church? What would you want us to just like drill down to? What would be the most helpful for your body? I was drawn back to this fundamental point, or perhaps better said, this fundamental question. Do you love Jesus? I'm not asking you if you believe in him. I hope you do. I hope you know what he did for you on the cross and that you put your faith in that work. I'm asking if you love him. It's hard to believe in him without loving him, but hopefully you'll understand my point here. Is it, does it go for you beyond just that the mental assent to this seems true to me, so I believe it? I'm asking if you love him. I'm asking if, he has, if you have allowed him to make his home in you. I mean, I would argue theologically that if you put your faith in Jesus, he's already done that, that God has already made his home in you, but perhaps you're not aware of it. Perhaps you are, uh, haven't thought about it. Perhaps you haven't received that truth and you're trying to live out this Christian life on your own. Maybe you're asking, maybe how can I tell? I don't know. That's kind of a weird thing to say, Tracy. Like, has he made his home in you? Weird. <laughs> How can I tell if that's true or not true? I'll tell you this. When your life is centered on following what Jesus taught, what he commanded, and it is your joy to obey him, you love him. And I'm not saying that um, as a sidebar to this scripture, that's what Jesus says. When you trust him with your decisions, your family, your future, your very life, you love him. And if that doesn't sound like you, don't worry. He will make his home in you when you invite the advocate to come alongside 
and teach you to live in and live for his presence. That's the promise. You are not alone. Here's the cool thing, too. We have just begun what Jesus taught us about the Holy Spirit. There's two more chapters of this gold from Jesus. But for now, I will tell you that from my life and my experience, growing up in the church, growing up in Pentecost, like growing up in all of these things, having seen so much and experienced so much and also questioned so much, I'll tell you that what changed for me in my 20s was realizing that I believed in Jesus, but I didn't really love him. My relationship with him was maybe more built out of duty. I, I certainly thought he was real. I'd seen too much evidence to, to prove otherwise, but I, I needed to grow in my love for him. And it's not a switch that you can turn on and turn off or anything like that. It was like me saying, Jesus, I want to see you for who you are. I want to see myself the way that you see me. And I want to grow in my love for you. And the more I did that, the more joy I got out of serving him, the more joy I got out of trusting him, the more I was able to say yes to the things he was asking me, even when they were difficult. And the more joy I found in doing that. And so I just ask you, is that where your heart is? Because I promise you that if you open your heart to him, he will lead you to this place. For you to learn day by day by day to love him. I think a turning point for me it was actually ex extraordinarily embarrassing. I'm not going to lie. You want me to tell you an embarrassing story? Yes, we would love that. That's our favorite. Thank you. I don't know how the Lord had done this in my life slowly, over time, over time, teaching me, teaching me, teaching me. And uh, we were doing a series on Revelation. And I sang the old Gaither song, um, These Are They who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Does anybody know this song other than my parents? I know you know it. <laughs> uh, and they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's a very powerful, very powerful song. We sang it as part of one of the messages. And I fell apart so hard. Some of you don't know this. You know how Pastor Aaron can cry? And she just has like a little choked up sound in her voice. And she has beautiful tears run down her face. And she just like can keep talking and whatever. I don't do that. I go from what you're seeing now to falling off a cliff and not being able to speak for like many, many minutes. And I was in the middle of the song and I realized like of this picture of going to heaven someday, seeing Jesus face to face and him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. See, this is the problem. You start talking like this. And I realized that as much as I loved everything, that the blessings I was living in, I love my family, and I love my work here, and I love what God is doing in my life, and even though there's a lot of difficulties along the way, I couldn't wait to meet him face to face. And I thought, I don't know when this happened. It was ugly and very embarrassing. And I just like, I was right here, and I was like, <laughs> that's how I sang the song. Not super effective, but... Very, very memorable for me. And also, I'll never sing it in public again because I don't know what's going to happen. To say, Jesus, I want to see you face to face. I don't know when I started to long for that. But I know that, that, that the Holy Spirit, the one who is called alongside, will come alongside, make his home in you, and teach you how to love the Lord. To make him your joy.